making it faded? No. Okay. You sure? I'm absolutely. You're absolutely sure? Mm-hmm. Because I could cut it off. Okay. <sighs> I'll see you come up. Go. <clears throat> Says you're my friend. I am your friend. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. your pal. I'm your buddy. Okay. There we are. We're centered. Sure. We've got one, two viewers. That's probably us. <laughs> us and somebody else. We're, us and somebody else is watching us. Oh, my. Okay. Four. Hey, Wanda. Love you. We're being silly. Hey, Marianne. Hey, Stacy. Roberta. Hey, Roberta. Love y'all. Hey, Brigitte. Hey, Wanda. Love you. I'm gonna yeah, you got to cut the volume off because that's like. We'll be repeat. We'll be repeating, repeating. Uh, Wanda said it was good to see you. It was good to see you guys, too. I hated that I had to come home so early. Excuse me? Well, I had a good visit with them. I know, but... But I had uh, rain on the way, as you predicted, so got home before much of it hit. <sighs> when Bible <clears throat> study is over, I must rapidly leave home and go and pick up the boys from school because Sarah has an appointment. So I'm going to try <clears throat> to not override the 2 o'clock hour. Um, I love y'all. It's good to see everybody. I'm going to click on there so I can see comments. Hey, Betty. Um, so we're going to jump into Proverbs 31. We are in verse 11 today. Please comment. Y'all know it makes it so much better when you comment. Um, this one is... I was actually able to get most of this Bible study done yesterday, and then this morning when I sat down to, to go back over and, you know, I always do it on a Word document, and then I print it off so I can refer to it that way. It saves me a little time during Bible study. And then I ended up with a ton more to add to it, so hopefully we'll get through it all, but... It's a good study. I love going back through Proverbs 31. I can't count the number of times in my adult life I've been through Proverbs 31. Because I need it. Are y'all good today? Everybody excited about the show that's going to be on TV or on news tonight? We don't have TV, but we watch it on the computer. Um, so let's go back and uh, talk about, we're doing the study, a practical study of the Proverbs 31 woman. We talked last week about um, has many skills that come from work over time and not just, um, you know, this isn't a teenage chick. This is a, an established mature. Well, it's good to see you. We also talked about how the Proverbs 31 woman um, is a model for us. She is an example. Um, and Linda Colantino had something else going on, but um, she brought out that she believed that it takes a lifetime to become the fully virtuous, established, accomplished woman. And I agree, it does take a long time. That doesn't mean that we should slow down because we think we're never going to attain. We should always be striving to attain. Um, just like we strive to attain to be like Christ. We don't just quit because we don't think we're going to make it. We keep working at it. So today, our focus is going to be on verse 11. And a lot of these verses through the next few weeks and months, we're going to do more than one verse in a, in a study. But these first couple just require their own day. So we're in verse 11, but we'll start in verse 10. 
Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above ruby, rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. And let me really preface this conversation by saying we have widows who watch Bible study. We have single ladies, unmarried ladies, some divorced ladies, ladies who do not have a physical husband in the home. <coughs> that doesn't mean that <coughs> this cannot be a wonderful chapter for you ladies to study. Because first of all, Scripture said that God is your husband. But secondly, these, these um, principles are very important um, in all of your relationships, in your children's lives, in your friends, your neighbors, your community. Uh, we are blessed to live in an incredibly loving community. Paul had to run up to the hardware store this morning. We got home. He said, I just, I really love where we live. The people are just amazing. And they are. They're just wonderful. So, so really in our community, we feel like it's family. You know, you go to the Piggly Wiggly and you see five or six people, you know, and get neck hugs and talk for a while. And it's just a wonderful place to be. So a lot of the aspects of this virtuous woman aren't just something for you to have with your husband. It's for those in your realm of influence in your life. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, absolutely. I think that's a good point. And um, a lot of times we pick and choose scripture based on, oh, that's, that's relative to me or not, but it's all relative to us. You just really have to, you have to think about it like she said, that you're, you're looking at your relationships and the character. If you're looking at this, and I won't get into your your study, but the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. If you think about being a trustworthy person, someone who who is has that kind of character, whether you have a husband or not. Very good. Thank you, honey. And yes, that is part of our study today. Oh. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. So, as always, I look up um, a lot of the words in the Greek and the Hebrew, and um, this is Old Testament, so these are Hebrew words. And the word heart in the Hebrew in this verse, and I'm not going to pronounce it, but it looks like leb, L-E-B, but I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, it means inner man, heart, mind, will, <clears throat> understanding, inner part, the soul of a man, the knowledge, thinking, reflection, memory, inclination, resolution, determination of the will, conscience. And these last three are, are so telling when you're talking about the heart, the seat of appetites, the seat of emotions and passions, the seat of courage. When I first studied this and put this in our original website, I was just overwhelmed by that hmm. because, you know, women just, our heart, we just, you know, it touches our heart or your heart's on your sleeve or it just moves your heart and all of the heart stuff. Even even when we're little bitty, we, the, one of the first things we learn to draw is a heart. The heart is just the center of our being. For most of us, mentally, we think, oh, if it's, boy, that just touches my heart. But the scripture tells us something very different about our heart. Our heart is not, should not be the guiding force in our life. And we're going to look at that. And in this verse is saying the heart of the husband doth safely trust in her. It's an important concept. Again, whether it's your husband, your friends, your family, your community, whatever, you as a virtuous woman should be the type of person that the people around you feel safe with. They should feel comforted. They should feel peaceful. Um, 
being around you, being in your presence, that is a mark of a virtuous woman, a virtuous follower of Christ. Um, it's something that's very lacking. And I said last week, you know, I noticed on a lot of the news where they're showing the rioting and all of the things going on out there in our country, so often it is screaming women filled with anger, filled with bitterness and rage. This is not the mark of a virtuous woman. This is not righteous indignation, screaming profanity, angry, just vehement against people. That's not the mark of a virtuous woman, and that is something we should shun. We should absolutely shun those emotional outbursts. And a lot of times we say, well, my heart's just broken, or my heart is just moved to anger. No, 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 no. If, if those around you are going to have confidence and have safe trust in you, it can't be spits of anger coming out of you all the time. Um, when you are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, you should, your will, your heart should be coming aligned with the things of God. But that doesn't mean that's always the case, again, because your heart is deceitful, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. We live in a flesh and blood body, but it should be the Spirit of God that is controlling our actions, our motives, every aspect of our life. The more mature we are in Christ, the more the Spirit should rule and not the flesh. Correct? Amen. Amen. So I wanted to look it up where it says the heart. It's used over 500 times in Scripture. So God knew how important the heart was to us. Genesis 42, 28. And we're just going to look at a few of the examples where the word heart, this exact same word, was used. And let me, let me stop for just a second. A lot of times when I'm going through Bible study, I get very, very simplistic about things that we just take for granted. We know what the heart of our husband is. We know what the heart of our husband is. But there's lots of aspects, and the Word of God is alive. It is, it is a living, breathing thing. And it's just like the facets of a, a diamond. You turn it a certain way, and there's, there's a reflection that maybe you didn't see before. And that's why I always try to look at different ways these words are used. In Genesis 42, 28, now this is talking about Joseph and his brethren. And it says, And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them. And they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? So here are these young men who are, they're the ones who put Joseph in the well and then sold him into slavery to Egypt. So these are young men who were already consumed with guilt. They had sinned greatly against their father and against their brother, and their hearts were already tainted with the weight of what they had done. So their hearts failed them for fear. When we get into sin, when we get into deceit, manipulation, it causes our hearts to be weakened. And I'm talking about that ephemeral heart, although sometimes the physical heart can suffer too, right? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's, there's the heart that is the mind, the will, and the emotions, and that's what I'm talking about. I think it's it's also really when people refer to the soul of a person. Mm -hmm. Genesis 45, 25, and 26. Genesis 45, 25, and 26. Again, this is dealing with Joseph's brothers. Now, they've been in Egypt. They have seen Joseph, they know that Joseph is, is a ruler in Egypt, and they've gone back to get their father. 
And it says, And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Jacob, Joseph's father, had already lost this son that he cherished. He'd been told this son was killed. He had grieved his entire adult life over the loss of his son. Now, his other sons have gone. They've kept the son Simeon in prison. He's had to send his youngest son, Benjamin. All of the stress of all of this has put such pressure on him that when they come back with what is truly an answer to every fear he had, a, a, a joyous, wonderful, glorious piece of news, his heart fainted. He just couldn't take one more thing. And when we are dealing with the mind and the will and the emotions of another human being, our goal as the daughters of the king, the goal of being a maturing, virtuous woman, should be to keep those thoughts in mind when we're dealing with others, whether it's your husband or someone else. We don't want to add weight to the burden they already carry. And you know, that reminds me, Jesus said, my burden is light. Jesus' burden is easy. But he also said, take up your cross. Well, you think of a cross as being heavy. But the things that God has assigned to us in our spirit, they are light. They are not burdensome. Our flesh may not like it, but our spirit walks hand in hand with the Lord and can receive the blessing of whatever that work is. Jacob had suffered already so greatly and his heart was faint. And I looked up faint-hearted. It means weakened, lacking confidence, lacking courage. As a wife, I think about my husband. When I'm making supper at night, I think, what does Paul want? What does Paul like? If Paul's been out in the heat all day, working hard, sweating, he's exhausted, I'm not going to make him soup. Soup warms the body. I'm going to make him a salad or something light because I want to benefit whatever is going on with him. I want to lighten the burden, whether it's the physical or the spiritual. And that's what we need to think about when dealing with those that we love. We want to lighten their load. We want to be a blessing to build them up. If, if my husband's heart safely trusts in me, it's because I've not laid more burden on him. Is that the way to say that? Yes. Okay. You can jump in anywhere. <laughs> You're doing good. Okay, look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. Ladies, y'all comment if you get something to, say, to share. Now, this is the opposite of faint-hearted. Verse 21, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that ye, thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. Now here's another example of a condition of the heart. The Lord will harden Pharaoh's heart. And you know, as a child, I never understood that. I could not understand why God would harden Pharaoh's heart. I understand much better now. There are multiple reasons why God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Um, one being, if Moses had walked in there and Pharaoh just said, Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead, take them all. Can you imagine the pride that would have soared within Moses? He was a man. He was a human being. And if he just walked into the mightiest king on the planet earth and said, you let those people go, and the king just bowed down and said, oh, okay, the humility would have been gone, I think. But Moses was a humble man, and this kept him humble because he had to trust God for each new step of the process. 
Sometimes when we deal with others, we feel like their heart has been hardened against us or against the Lord. And while we may know in our spirit, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, our flesh still gets angry. It gets frustrated and mad, and I don't know why you're not taking care of this God. Right now, we are praying for someone that has a hard heart, just a hard, hard heart. And we're asking the Lord for a Damascus Road experience for this person, that this person would run into the place where he cannot run anymore, and that God will... Make that moment in time where he can receive the truth and walk in it. But what had to happen to Paul, Saul, before when he hit that Damascus road? He was blinded. God put scales over his eyes so he had to be led. We don't know what workings the Lord will do in someone's life. But our goal has got to be reconciliation with Christ for everyone whether it's our husband or someone else that we're dealing with, we need their heart to safely trust in what God is doing in their life and where we're involved. Do y'all agree? Um, ex let's see, I think I did, uh, Exodus 35, 4 and 5. Exodus 35, 4 and 5. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. So we have seen faint-hearted, we have seen hard-hearted, and now we're looking at a willing heart. God does not force anyone to do anything. It's pointless. Just like forcing a little child to say they're sorry when they're not. Pointless. You ever done it? Little four-year-old hits the six-year-old in the face with a block. Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. They're not sorry. They're not the least bit sorry. We're trying to form a habit. But the truth is, until their heart is willing to apologize, willing to make things right, that's when progress is made. And God is not going to force you or force anybody to say they're sorry. And let me tell you, wives, Trying to force your husband to apologize is like spitting in the wind. It's only going to backfire on you. If your husband has done something and it has hurt you, don't rile yourself up, hunch your back, start yelling, and, and or, I'm sorry, I know I've done this, Paul. Just stop talking to him altogether. I'm just not going to talk to you anymore. I love the line out of a movie, and I can't remember where we've heard it, but man talking to the woman, and and uh, when he realizes that he had done her wrong, he said, why didn't you tell me about that so that I could apologize? And she said, if this was such a small thing that an apology would have fixed it, I would have said that to you. In other words, it was a bigger thing. You should have. It should have been so obvious that you should have known without me having to tell you Wow. You know, when you look at your wife and she's crying and you say, did I hurt you? Did that, did that hurt your feelings? <laughs> you and know? the wife says, duh. <laughs> yep. But we do use our flesh to try to force what we want. And it doesn't work. It is a waste of time. Now, Paul and I, are blessed in our relationship that if something happens between us, we just sit down and talk it out. And we don't get into long dr drug out conversations, do we? Don't have to. Don't have to. Right because to the point. That's right. And, and because I love him and want the best for him, 
and he loves me and wants the best for me, we can quickly resolve pretty much anything. Anything. That doesn't mean that we've never had an argument. We have. But I, I'll be honest with you, most of the arguments Paul and I have ever had are because of someone else. And they weren't very long-lasted. They were very short. So praise God for that. But a willing heart is required for any progress to be made. And, I, and I'm just going to encourage all of us, let's not waste time with fruitless arguments. Unless that person that you're dealing with, or unless you have a willing heart, don't try to force the issue. It's just a waste of time. It really is. We're going to look at one more on the heart. 1 Samuel 28, 4 and 5. 1 Samuel 28, 4 and 5. Are y'all still there? You still with me? First Samuel 48 or 28, 4 and 5. Now this is about King Saul, and King Saul has turned away from the path of God. He is not walking as the anointed of the Lord. And it says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. This is the same word as in Proverbs 31.11, his heart doth safely trust in her. His heart, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. Why would the anointed of God be so fearful that his heart trembled when facing the enemy? Because he had already stepped into sin. When we are in sin, whether you are the king of Israel or you are a humble little homemaker in Clay County, Alabama, if you're walking in sin in your life, your heart's going to tremble with fear. Men are just like women in these things. Maybe they're, you know, different levels of emotion and all of that. But a husband can be afraid. He can be in error. He can be unwilling to change. All of the same aspects that are in the women are in the men. They're just less emotional about it. And if we want to build the heart of our husband, if we want to strengthen the heart of our husband, if we want to strengthen the people in our life and build them up in the Lord, we've got to have wisdom in how we're dealing with them and the problems in life. It's no, it's no challenge when everything's happy and perfect. That's a no-brainer. You don't have to focus. But when there is struggle or there's contention or there's an attack coming from somewhere. <coughs> we must be wise in dealing with the heart of our husband. Because the goal is for his heart <coughs> to safely trust in his wife. I, like I said before, this is, this is really pertaining to any relationship. I want to be trustworthy to those around me. I want their heart to feel safe in my presence. Yay! Jeremiah 17, 9. Y'all know this one already. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That is one of those that you need to put somewhere so you can see it all the time to remind yourself not to trust your heart. Your heart will deceive you. The next passage, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So God, Amen. God purifies our hearts. Yes, he does. 
Yes, he does. Ezekiel 36, 26. I'm just going to read this one. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh, meaning a soft heart. And I've spent almost 30 minutes talking about the heart because we've got to recognize the motivation of your heart is what's going to be, bring about the action of your flesh. Your husband needs to have peace in how you function. Your children need to have peace in how you function. Your neighborhood needs to have peace. You know, if there's somebody in a neighborhood that is not quite all there, everybody in the neighborhood is aware of it. Everybody in the neighborhood walks more carefully because you don't know what's going to come from that person. If you work in an office, everybody in the office knows that one volatile person. What is primary is that we not be that volatile person. We need to be the calm. We need to be the trustworthy, the peaceful the blessing instead of the one that everybody's afraid of and everybody's walking on eggshells. And I'm going to tell you what, I, I have known men in my life, in our church, different things like that, not known their wife, but I could tell you what kind of wife they had. The reason being because when, when men get nervous and fidgety and it's just out of character, and you know that somebody, somebody in their in their life is picking. You can see it in children when a child is constantly looking around and constantly walking in fear. Someone has has put them in that place of fear, and we don't want our husbands to have to feel that way. We want our husbands to safely trust that no matter what's going on, their wife's not going to blow up. They're not going to have to worry about what comes out of her mouth when they're gathered around other people. He's not going to have to be scared to death every day that the power's going to get shut off or the phone's going to get turned off or somebody's going to come repossess his car because the bills didn't get paid. Now, I'm not talking about a man who is causing those problems. But... If, you know, it's, we all know that wife, don't we? Mm -hmm. We all know that wife. But you also don't want to be that way in your community, in your family. You don't want to be that person. Um, the word, the phrase, safely trust in her, that's reciprocal. I told Paul when we were first married and we were talking about marriage and, and you know, our hopes and dreams for the future and all. I said, you know, honey, I said, the truth is, all a woman wants is to feel safe. We just want to feel safe. And I can say without any doubt, Paul, all of our lives has made me feel safe. The word for that, they talk, and I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, to trust, to trust in, to have confidence in, to be bold to be secure, to feel safe, to be careless. And I double-checked that. It's not careless. It's careless, without care, without fear, without concern. Are you, do I make you feel insecure or concerned about my behavior? No, and I, I mean, I don't know how far you're going to go into this, but... You're talking Pretty about far. the heart of a man, and you know, you men, women want safety and security, and love. They want to be loved. Men want respect. You know, that's how you love a man is you respect him. And I've known men that if their phone rang and they looked down to call her ID or looked at the cell phone, and it was their wife, they oh. just they just did that. 
Um, I remember a man leaving work one day and he looked at the clock and it was time to go home and he literally said, well, it's time to go home to hell. Oh. And I, I felt so bad for him. I didn't know what was going on. It might not have been his wife. It might have been some other situation. Maybe he had a plumbing disaster at home. I don't know. But men should not feel like their wives are, or if they look down and their wife is on the caller ID. And you know what I'm talking about when you get that caller ID and you look to see who it is and it's that person you don't want to talk to. It's that um, collection agency. Um, you haven't paid the utility bill and it's the utility company calling you. Uh, you owe somebody some money. They haven't talked to you in several months. You look down, it's them calling and Men should never feel that way about their wives. They should be able to look down and, and I can tell you, I look down with joy out of my day when my wife has messaged me or calls me. I never feel like it's, oh, she needs something again. She never makes me feel that way. It's always, I mean, she may need something, milk and bread, but it's always, you know, cheerful it's always that she makes me feel better about my day that is the break in my day when <coughs> when i hear that and that's the way it should be amen except the one time i called you and i said where's the gun and i hung up the phone <laughs> that's another story that is another story but i have to tell you a snippet we we lived in talladega and we had a, a chicken tractor it was just a big pen for our chickens and um a wild dog had ripped the fencing off of this thing and was inside the chicken tractor eating my chickens. And I had just gotten home and found this and I could not find our little gun, this little gun that we had. And I, I was getting frantic and I called Paul at work and I said, where's the gun? And he said, well, it's in such and such. And, and without even thinking, I just hung up the phone. And on my end, I hear the phone <laughs> ring. It's my sweet wife. Oh, it's my wife calling me. And I'm, I just left for coming home and I answered. And she said, quick, where's the gun? And I said, um, um, she said, that's not quick enough. Where's the gun? I said, it, it's, and I, I, I told her where it that. was. She's, and then there was click. Now, so I'm driving you, down the road. <laughs> Were you okay, safely trusting that me? That wasn't quick enough. <laughs> and uh, then she called back about five minutes later and said, when will you be home? And I said, <laughs> about 25 minutes, she said. And then she told me the situation. But that, I'm telling you. That was the one time you didn't trust safely in me, right? Well, I did trust safely in you. I told you where the gun was. <laughs> That's true. And I got the gun, and I went out there, and I started shooting, and I <laughs> emptied the gun and did not shoot that dog one time. I did not get him one time. However, I did scare him, and he somehow managed to get out of the pen, and there weren't many chickens left. I do remember that. But, yeah. So, now y'all know everything. Quick, where's the gun? Quick, where's the gun? As a wife, helping our husband to feel secure and that he does not have to worry is the goal. In this verse, for sure. As a friend, to not <coughs> be the drama queen, always needing pity or, or causing strife, or always having some crisis happening that really could have been taken care of if what was needed to be done was done properly. As a Christian, not being indulgent and permissive of, of carnal things. Now, ladies, if we are being, if we are a daughter of the king, our life should be continually, progressively moving up, spiritually speaking. 
our life should not be a parade of the next carnal activity. And when I say carnal, I mean worldly. I mean something that does not bring God glory in any way, shape, or form. Something that is merely to please and indulge your flesh. If you are just looking for the next fun thing, instead of growing and your focus is growing and maturing in God. And I know a lot of folks say, well, God loves me the way I am. He made me the way I am. Then why is Jesus, why did Jesus go to the cross? If you were perfectly fine the way you are, you didn't need Jesus to go to that cross. We should be changing. We should be maturing. We should be growing. We should not be looking for more and more to please our flesh. So as a Christian, for, for our Christian brothers and sisters to safely trust in who we are as a Christian, we should be progressing more in Christ and not attaining more of the world. As a daughter of the Most High God, we should not be ignoring the truth of God's word because it is inconvenient to what we want to do. Refusing to walk in his ways and choosing to walk in our own opinions does not bring a sense of security to those we love. There is absolutely no pleasure in this world worth compromising another person. Amen. There's just not. And if you're not happy, and if you don't feel good, and if you're walking in misery, and you're having to reach out to the world to fix it, you're not in a good place, sweetheart. You're not. And I don't say sweetheart to demean you. I'm saying we love you. We will help you if we can. You can reach out to us. Message us. We'll do everything we can to help. But don't seek this world to ease your problems. It won't. It will only make them worse. It will make your heart tremble. Um, I wanted to read this to you. Dig for the truth. And when you begin to see areas where you may have not been trustworthy, repent before the Lord and then repent before your husband or loved one or whoever you're dealing with. Let me point out that when you repent, you do not add excuses. That is not repentance. Acknowledge you're wrong, accept responsibility, and then make the changes necessary. There is tremendous joy on the other side of repentance, and it will be worth it. Yeah. I learned that when I was about 16 years old. I was, <clears throat> I'm not going to give a lot of details, but I was in a place and I had done something super not good. And when the person that was in authority um, sat me down and we were discussing it, and they said, why in this world did you do that? And, the, and I was so, crying and so sorry and so just grieved that I had done what I did. And I was opening my mouth to say how sorry I was. The first thing, the words that were coming out of my mouth were an excuse, a reason why to make an excuse. And instantly, I will never forget it. The Holy Spirit flooded me and said, if you have to add an excuse, you are not sorry. And I've never forgotten that moment. That was 40 years ago. And to this day, I realize that in my mind, if I'm sorry for something and my mind starts bringing up, but, but such and such and such, you're not sorry, Angie. 
If you've got to try to explain why it was okay or why you did it, you're not sorry. That's not repentance. That's something we really need to work on. So if Paul and I are having a discussion and, and we're getting frustrated with each other and I say something ugly or I've done something I shouldn't have done and he says, why? And I, this is, we don't really have discussions like this, but... And I say, but honey, what if, but you know, well, you did this. Boom. Boom. If you have to throw up their mistake in order to justify your own, not repentant. Not repentant. Trustworthiness. Proverbs 10, 9. Again, our base scripture is Proverbs 31, 11. His heart doth safely trust in her. Proverbs 10, 9. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his way shall be known. The word uprightly is also integrity. He that walketh in integrity walketh surely. If you are walking honorably with integrity and uprightly, You don't have to worry about what's going on because you, you don't have to fear what you may have done wrong. When there's no crime, you don't have to worry that you'll be, a, you might be accused, I don't know, but you don't have to worry you won't have guilt, is what I'm saying. Proverbs eleven thirteen. Proverbs eleven thirteen. A talebearer reveal, revealeth secrets. <laughs> But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. So oh, that's one of those robocalls. <laughs> a talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Faithful meaning trustworthy and reliable. Now I'm going to tell you, that doesn't count or that isn't apropos when you're dealing with needing to... Tell a truth that must be told. Is that thing still ringing? Yeah. It'll stop. It sure did. Yeah. If if somebody is in a bad situation, you can't get mad when that comes to light. You can't get angry when that comes to light because nine times out of ten, I don't. That's one of those things. Nine times out of ten, whoever is revealing it is doing it to try to save you. So, and I, you know, I've had things like that. I've had actually the girls told Paul one time not to tell, or Paul told the girls one time not to tell me about something about a situation because he was trying to protect me from getting That's upset. Right. Huh? That's fine. Okay. And um, and I found out anyway. But it was something I needed to deal with. It was something that, that truly needed to not be secret. Be, they were trying to protect me, but I, I really needed to deal with the situation. Your husband needs to trust you to keep what is his private. You don't need to be tail-bearing things about your husband. You don't need to be telling your girlfriends or anybody else things that are private about your husband because then he has reason to not trust you. Same thing with people in the community, friends, family. We don't need to be tailbearers. That robs people of their faith and trust in you. And the second part of the scripture is he will have no need of spoil. Spoil meaning... Plunder, booty, prey, um, gain by dubi dubious means. This can refer to anything, not just money. If, if your husband feels it's got to, to be going all the time, accumulating, getting, 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 is it that his wife is spending every penny he brings in? Now, I'll tell you, Paul and I, we don't have a whole lot we, as money goes. I mean, we don't have like massive amounts of savings. and and But Paul has no need of spoil. And um, 
we laugh about this because in his job, he gets extra money for mileage when he has to drive to all these outer offices. And he puts in his mileage in his on his uh, daily reports, and then we get that extra money on his paychecks. And um, otherwise, you know, he's salary. And for about three weeks, he didn't put in his mileage. And we were talking one day, and I said something, and I need to put the mileage in. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I haven't done it in about three weeks. And I looked at him, I said, what? He said, I haven't put in mileage. But at the time, I thought, oh, my goodness, there is money supposed to be on that paycheck that's not there. But I realized that that was a blessing to me, that he doesn't have to worry about things like that. He it doesn't he doesn't walk around worried sick if his paycheck is going to cover all of the bills. Right, because my paycheck does cover the bills. Yes, I'm just his, he will have no need of overtime. Of, oh, yes. He will have no need <laughs> of a second job. Yeah. Or having to go out and sell some of his things to pay the bills. Now, I will say, there. you know, sometimes you do need to get a second job. If your paycheck's not covering, but it shouldn't be because the wife is blowing every penny of what he makes. Yep. Now, if the wife is just buying food and trying to keep diapers on the babies and there's still not enough money, go get a second job, husband. And I'm not going to get into wives being keepers at home because... If I get into that, boy, will I get into it good. But ladies, we don't need to be just spending, spending, spending. What do you need? Is it the pleasures of the flesh? There we go again. But this can refer to anything, not just money. It can be anything that's lacking, and that makes a need, a desire for more, 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 more. My husband does not need to feel like he is lacking because I am not diligently using what he's provided. One of the saddest aspects of our modern society is a lack, is a, a lust for things. That is a pandemic. That is a pandemic, is the lust for more things. Stacy said... Uh, well, Marianne said, this is so meaty, I'm speechless. Stacy said, I would love to hear what you have to say about that subject. Stacy, we'll talk. What's, what subject? Are I'm we... assuming she's talking about women being keepers at home. Oh. Is that what you're talking about, Stacy? The women being keepers at home? See, that's why we need to do a Zoom call. We need to have a Zoom call on stuff like that, that not everybody um, wants to be part of, but those that do can. 1 Timothy 6, 5 through 9. I'm going to go ahead so we don't lose time. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. There is a huge movement in the last year or two of folks becoming preppers. We have seen folks in our, lots of people in our area garden, but we have seen lots of folks that never had gardens around here have plowed up their yards and have gardens. People are canning more than they ever did before. Um, fabric is is being sold out at the stores where they sell fabric because people are doing more sewing. Uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the Foxfire books are being sold out in the bookstores because people realize the shelves may not always be overflowing. 
there there may not be the abundance <coughs> of things to go by. And folks are trying to be a little bit wiser and provide for their families with their own hands. And I love it. I think it's wonderful. But it is still very, very sad to see, my goodness, to see so many still chomping at the bit to go shopping, buy all this new stuff. And and sadly, there's a lot of, of men and women who... Shopping is their comfort. They just don't feel good unless they can go out and buy some things. And it's a very tragic thing. Amen. You know, that's great, Belinda. And I have some friends who live in larger cities who have bought chickens. And they put little chicken pens in their backyards, but they don't buy the roosters. They just buy hens because roosters crow and hens don't. And um, I always tell everybody, if you need a silent livestock, get a rabbit. Rabbits don't make any noise, but you can eat them. And they create manure for your garden. Easy to butcher, tasty. That's right. He will have no need of spoil is the part we're on right now. If there is a need for other additional um, gain... You've got to ask yourself, what is being done with what is provided? Um, and I'm almost out of time, and I'm right at the end. Yay. The word for content in Hebrew is ya'el, which means to agree, show willingness, acquiesce, be willing to undertake, to resolve, be pleased, be determined, be content. There is nothing sadder than seeing a man who is struggling over and over, struggling, 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 because his wife is never content. That is such a tragedy. And ladies, let me tell you, when you make up your mind to be at peace with what is already provided, you will never know more happiness there is such a sweetness in being content. I don't have to. Well, that was one of the, the blessings of a plain lifestyle. We did not, we, you know, I used to get all these catalogs and, and um, all these beautiful magazines and I, I just, you know, we, all these things I wanted and and new clothes and oh look at those shoes and look at that makeup and, and the, oh those earrings I need those earrings and and I needed to redo my living room and buy new furniture and and uh, all of that stops when you find that place of contentment and when you as a woman find that your entire family feels that relief is that not true? Amen. A man doesn't feel like he's failing all the time because he can't provide you with all of the stuff. Find contentment so that your husband has no need of spoil and encourage him in the same things. Yeah. Encourage him in the same exact things. Sure, we can get caught up in it too. You know, Absolutely. the catalogs and the wanting something new, even if it's, uh, how, you know, st saying stepping into the plain life is, can have its own new list of wants. You can have, I, oh, now I need a tractor. Now I need plows. Now I need a planter. Mm -hmm. Now I need new fencing. Now I need a barn. Now, you know, all the needs, but you can be content where you are in whatever situation. That's right. I'm not saying you can't improve yourself in things, but when you, you know, okay, now I have a tractor, but I need a bigger tractor. Mm -hmm. You know, if God's given you the tools, then be content with that. Amen. Amen. The Hebrew word for contentment means a perfect condition of life in which no aid or extra support is needed. Sufficiency of the necessity of life. A mind contented with its lot. 
can we be content and thereby release our husband of the pressure to always, always be working harder, working more? I had a really good friend when we lived in Florida, and they, they had plenty. They were not lacking in anything. But uh, I remember she came to Bible study one day and we were sitting around talking and, and just talking about things in the families and life and all of that. And she said, well, she said, I got, I got something good from the Lord this week. And she said she had been praying for a long time for more money. They needed some more money. And um, her husband... The job he had, he was sort of at the peak of his income for that position. And she was just praying, God, we just need more money. You know, I've got this and this, and I just, I've got to have more money. And his company blessed him with large amounts of overtime. He got lots of overtime. He got so much overtime that he was barely at home long enough to sleep before he had to get up and go back to work the next morning. And this went on for years. And the Lord revealed to her that he had answered the prayer that she had persisted in praying. They had more money, but she did not have her husband. He was working constantly. And as the Lord revealed that to her, she went to him and she said, I have really made a mistake. And she said, I'm, I'm sorry. And we are going to cut down. We're going to cut back. And that was, gosh, that was nearly 30 years ago. And they're still married. The kids are grown. They're doing great. But they found out that more money was not the answer. And she needed to be content with what they had. And so I will leave you with that. Focus on your husband or those around you safely trusting in you and having no need of spoil because of you, because of your influence, because of my influence. And I will say this, one more thing. That is why the plain people, the Amish, the Mennonites, live in very similar homes with very little. They do not want to incite jealousy in one another by having a fancier home or fancier clothing or, or all of that. They all live in homes that are very basic and very much the same. Their homes are only different in size to accommodate the family members and um that's that's really now obviously we don't live in a plain home that way we i i have a belief that this home is to be comfortable mm -hmm. and a haven and a joy to the family that is here and uh, so we don't exactly live a very uh, austere life that way but if you ever wondered why all of the plain houses were just white clapboard and, and no adornments that way, that's why. They don't want to incite jealousy from one person to another where I can afford all of this and you can't. Something to think about. It's okay to sacrifice for the blessing and help of another. It's okay to do without something you could have so that somebody who couldn't have it doesn't have to feel bad. So we'll leave you there. Next week we'll do Proverbs 31, verse probably um, 12 and 13 next week. And thank y'all for joining me. And again, when we get um, everything, if y'all are going to do Zoom, and we're not going to do that for ladies' Bible study, we're going to do that for extras. Maybe... Uh, a morning call and just have a, a good friendly tea time and conversation about things so if you want to be connected with zoom send me your zoom email and I will send you an invitation to be a contact 
And then I will let y'all know when we are going to do an actual Zoom gathering. And I will encourage you to do that because I know Angie could use the fellowship. And I know you ladies, probably with the pandemic, a lot of people are using Zoom and Skype and conference calls and that kind of thing. And I think you would really enjoy it. Uh, meeting face to face and having that interaction besides the Tuesday one o'clock Bible studies um, try that and see if you yeah. don't really get something out of it more of a fellowship tea time you could have you know Bible discussions but but maybe sometimes not I mean Christians just need friends too that's right we could just have tea and make cookies together and you know, you just never know what it could grow into. Yeah. I love y'all, and we will see y'all. Is this Sunday church here? Yeah. Okay. Church on Sunday, hopefully, unless this is a call week for Andy, and we'll be at their house, but yep. we'll let you know. My message should be on fruit, uh, the gifts of the Spirit Sunday. Oh, I, I can't wait. I guess you'll have to. <laughs> love y'all. Bye. Bye.